I think all of us in this room have had some kind of conversation with a well-intentioned relative um, or a friend um, who at some point, you know, sort of asking us what we were doing um, and we told them that we were studying English, kind of looked at us with this sort of blank expression, maybe one that turned a little bit into kind of horror, um, <laughs> and then said something, um, something along the lines of, you know, aren't you wasting your life for, <laughs> you know, why would you study anything like English today? Uh, now, this isn't a new question. I was asked this many times, um, and in fact, it's, it's related to a long tradition of, of um, questioning the value of the humanities, but it's a question that's become really more pressing in the last 10 years, and that's partly for economic reasons that we could discuss, or we don't have to either, because that's not really the important thing, and the important point is, is your, your circumstances here. But I think it has meant that students are under increasing pressure these days from their families, from their friends, from the government, from you know, administration, to go to university to um, study something that's going to lead to a job. Um, now, this also is predicated upon a misconception that if you study humanities, you're never going to get a job. Um, and that is simply not true. But part of the problem is that as opposed to engineering programs or medical programs or architectural programs which kept statistics about student placements, humanities programs never had that evidence because there was no point. It wasn't a, tech, it wasn't a training school. We didn't think about that. And now people are beginning to get that evidence. And I think it's, it's basically quite reassuring uh, for people about the kinds of jobs that you can get. Um, but that said, it seems to be already kind of skewing the, the question in a way that I think is, is a little bit unfortunate. Because it does assume that you go to university to learn a, a trade, basically, that's going to prepare you for the job market. Um, now, no one goes to university with the hopes that they will be emerge from university completely unprepared to do anything whatsoever. Um, however, I think it's 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 perhaps not the conception that we many of us share about what a university education is for, um, why one comes to university. And I think it's a question that people in English, also in philosophy and history and other humanities uh, programs, are you know really have to, to think about. Um, now, in the current situation, there's been a lot of talk in the media about a crisis in the humanities. Can universities, can society afford to have students studying things like you know English literature? Um, and there's been a lot of discussion um, by administrators and by professors, uh, and that's very important, of course. Um, but the problem is that, as some of us in the room know, no one ever listens to professors, um, especially not administrators or governments, um, especially not when we're talking about the value of what we do, because it seems like it's, it's self-interested. Um, and I think it's really, really important for these conversations to be taken over by students, um, because you are really the evidence, actually that what we are doing is still important. Um, we all know that humanities humanities programs are shrinking um, in North America, uh, but there still are a surprising number of students who are taking you know, these courses, despite the fact that the message that they're getting from society is that that's not what you should be doing. And I think that really is important for us to articulate and for you to articulate to yourselves, to your family, and also to the world outside about why you feel this is valuable. Because I think it is really does, does come down to questions to what is valuable in life and what is meaningful in our lives, um, which often gets lost in the practical discussion about what's gonna get you a job. Um, so what I hope today is that we would just have a, a beginning conversation about this. And so I've asked three, uh, well, six students, uh, we're missing one at the moment, but um, I hope she will show up. Um, to offer their perspectives about why they, they study English um, and you know, their, their experiences perhaps in coming to, to uh, McGill as well in, in terms of, of um, resistance they might have met. Um, and then what I was hoping is just from the beginning that we would turn out to a larger discussion. You can have, you know, ask questions or just offer your own opinion. Because as I, 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 I do say, I think it's important for, for you to start thinking and expressing to yourselves about what it is that you feel is valuable about what you're doing. You feel, should feel proud and good about, about what you're studying, the fact that you're, you're studying English. Um, and I think there's, there's always kind of solidarity of talking to, hearing about what other people believe. Um, 
as well as, I hope perhaps occasionally, ammunition that you might get um, to use against those well-intentioned relatives. Uh, so I'll just introduce you know, the, the five speakers that we have at the moment uh, to begin with, and then we're just going to go around the table. Uh, so Ronnie Litvak Katzman, who's a, a U1 undergraduate, and Rachel Smith, who's in the first year of the MA program, and Lee Sigler, who's in the first year of the MA program as well, Nicole Krenick, who's in, in U1 undergraduate, and Jana Perkins, who's a, in U, the first year of the MA as well. So, Ronnie, you can start us off. Sure. Um, I find a lot of the conversations I have with people about my degree are conversations that I'm embarrassed to have. And it's a very interesting feeling to talk about yourself and feel embarrassed about something. You don't want to feel embarrassed about something in life that you're passionate yeah. about or a, a pursuit that, you're, that you're, you're spending all this time and, frankly, all this money to go <laughs> achieve. Um, and I draw this, this feeling back to a very prominent conversation in my mind that I had in residence. And I lived on a floor with a very interesting combination of people. There were some music majors, but the majority was STEM. Um, and I should preempt this by saying that, I, I, like including English, I'm also in um, biology, organismal biology. I'm doing an arts and science degree. So there's a little bit of that, of that pull between the STEM side of my brain, the right side of the left side, and then <laughs> the, the humanity side of me. And I was having this conversation with some kids on my floor, and someone said to me something along the lines of, it's really great that you're getting this subjective education. And then you can contrast that with your objective <laughs> education in STEM. Yeah. And I thought those were just the most interesting words I had ever heard someone use to describe my degree because from our standpoint, and I know a lot of people in the room can probably attest to this, that it's not subjective. There are texts <laughs> and there are authors and we are, we are interpreting something with our own minds, but it's not like we're grabbing things out of thin air and, and, just, and just speaking about them. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this divide between the objectivity and the subjectivity of especially the natural sciences versus the humanities. Um, there, there's a lot of benefits, I think, to a subjective, and I'm going to use quotations for the word subjective because we can debate that later, but a subjective education, which is, is based on interpretation versus based in hard observable fact. Um, it's really difficult, I think, as a natural scientist to, to, to be completely objective. I think the idea of objectivity in science in itself is kind of a flawed issue. Um, we think of thinkers like Thomas Kuhn and, and, and of, of the such that, that really brought us into this new era where you need a subjective attitude or your subjective attitude can't just be ignored. You need a certain grasp on what you're doing in order to go in and come to like an objective conclusion. So what ways has my subjective English education really made me a better scientist? I think that's really the core of the question for why I'm doing this degree, at least for me. Um, and there's a, mul there's a multitude of ways. I think it, it really boils down to my ability to make an argument and to, to, to see something that maybe may have subjective viewings to it and really take away something from it that is concrete. And it doesn't necessarily mean that I look at um, a set of data in the same way that I did that in a poem. But it's the same set of skills at the end of the day, and I really think a lot of what people don't understand about English and humanities in general is that the skill set is transferable. It's not this static thing where I'm learning how to read Shakespeare, and once I understand Shakespeare, I can go out and <coughs> talk about Shakespeare. I mean, the ability to, to understand language foremost and then to decipher language secondarily are skills that are transferable across many, many disciplines. I would say that any discipline where you're required to read or write, which is most of academia, are these kind of transferable skills. And I think the idea of a transferable skill is, is almost the power of especially an English degree. Mm -hmm. And I always tell, I tell this to my mom all the time, that when you're, when you're taking a degree such as English, you're not just learning poetry. You're not just learning you're not just learning how to, how to decipher it, you're, you're also learning history, natural history, the history of ideas, and the history of ideas is the history of science. Science in itself, though it can be objective, is based in the ideas of humanity and the ideas of the way that we interpret the natural world, and I, I really can't see much of a difference between 
that and what we do in English. It's just interpretations of our world and different viewpoints and vantage points of how we see the natural world around us. So those are, I think, that's, I think the, the base of my argument is that the idea that English is isolated and that we live in this little perfect community where, <laughs> where, <laughs> where everything is okay and we, we can ignore everything else around us is so far removed from the reality of what English really is, where it's so intertwined and so in touch with the natural world around us. I wrote in here, how has Milton made me a better scientist? <laughs> That's what I want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> and, I think, I, and I think it's a hard question. I mean, when I find myself a lot of the time when I'm reading a paper, a scientific paper, and a lot of the questions, especially in an organismal biology degree, that boil down to questions of evolution and questions of, of originality and where life on Earth came from, are a lot of the same questions that I'm finding in Milton um, and, and many other English <coughs> writers where we're probing kind of the beginning. We're probing what the beginning looked like. And I've always thought that that's such, that's such a... <laughs> such a metaphysical, almost like insane concept to me that, that we're, we're, we're looking at the same thing in, in many different ways and they're not necessarily in opposition to each other and that a lot of these things are actually interconnected and that we can, we can pull from one side in order to enhance our understanding of the other. English fits in, in this, into this world, I think, beyond the natural sciences where where the communication of, of <coughs> students, especially students as yourselves, who have this great understanding of the written word and understanding of how to interpret the written word, is so important to science. And I think a lot of what science loses in that is, is the idea that we come back to this, and at the end of the day, your, your objective figures are your objective figures. And I completely agree that, that there is an objective truth to something that is observable. But the objective truth and how that translates into the real world are two very different things. Truth can stand on its own, it can stand alone by itself, but the way that we interpret truth and the way that we reflect that in, in our societies is up to us. I mean, I think as English majors and as humanities majors that we are the ones who decipher the truth. We can be given truthful, objective things, and I can put all of this in quotation marks, um, but we can be given these truthful and objective realities and it's still up to us to, de to decipher them, to determine how those are going to lead us in our society. So when you get people, I mean, when I think of natural scientists that also became philosophers, someone like Francis Bacon, who, who laid out a methodology, basically the methodology for the natural sciences in, in going into the, the 18th, 19th, 20th century, he, he posed something very apt, I think, that we need to remember that even in the objectivity that we're trying to study, that there are still subjective repercussions to what we are learning, to what we are discovering. So for me, myself as a scientist, I think it's important that I have English to, to reflect. It's a very reflective medium, I think, you re when you're reading, when you're sitting alone at a cafe <laughs> in the middle, on a Sunday afternoon with a book, I think it's a very reflective medium, and I find myself jumping a lot between the thoughts of what I'm studying in some of my courses and what I'm studying in the others, and it's, a, it's, very, it's very multifaceted. Um, so back to this feeling about being embarrassed. <laughs> and it's a hard feeling to overcome because you don't, you, it's, it's, at the end of the day, you do want to pat yourself on the back, and a degree is a degree, and it's an accomplishment in itself. <laughs> but I really think we should take pride, if anything, in the fact that we're, that we're English majors. Um, I take pride in almost the basis of the fact that we are continuing a beautiful, beautiful tradition. Um, I also take pride in the fact that we are, we are constantly learning and adapting, and English is not something that is static in the same way that science is not something that is static, that, that there are movements to it and that there are um, different subcategories of it in classes which evolve and talk to each other. And I also think it helps you argue the harder questions, because science poses a lot of difficult questions in the same way that English does, and I think that, that hu the human perspective and being able to reflect on that is what's going to lead us to those finite answers. I don't, I don't necessarily agree with, this, agree with the fact that 
that some figures on a page can tell me more than someone like Milton can, I think. They both tell you very subjective, <laughs> truthful things. Um, but for us to pull that objectivity, to pull those realities from something like English or something like biology is really dependent on that skill set to make those arguments and to be able to decipher. And I think, if anything, that that's definitely the most important part of this degree. Just in, it's very multifaceted. I think it's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's all I have to say. Thanks, Ronnie. <laughs> no problem. Um, okay. I just want to start out by saying that usually when I talk to my peers about why they're studying English, most people start out with, I've always loved reading mm -hmm. since I was a kid, and I actually hated reading growing up. <laughs> um, so when I was really young, like six, I actually claimed that I would never read a book because I absolutely hated it, and both my parents are educators. So they were absolutely horrified, and they had this rule in the summer that both my sister and I had to read at least a novel a month. And my sister would read like 20 fantasy novels every month, and I would refuse to read any of them. <coughs> Probably partly because my sister liked to read, mm -hmm. and I couldn't like anything that she liked. <laughs> um, but I didn't really start reading until I was 15. Um, I was bullied in high school, left the school, and homeschooled myself through to grade 12 online. And I also broke my femur the same year. So I was kind of bedridden, and you can only watch so much TV <laughs> before you get bored, so I started reading. And I also had a lot more time to read because I was schooling myself, so I could get through my work much faster. So I read The Bell Jar to satisfy my grade 11 um, English curriculum, and then I read The Crucible, and then I just kept going from there. Um, and when I started university, right after high school, I started as a biopsychology student. Um, I didn't do that because I felt like any familial pressure, like my mom has a history degree and my dad has a music degree, so I couldn't really comment on that. Um, but I, I think I had to internalize kind of years and years of teachers and movies and social media and all of that telling me that STEM degrees were the only kind of worthwhile degree. Um, but luckily for me, everyone at my university had to take an undergraduate English course of some sort and you got to choose between a couple. And I enrolled in a course called Great Moments in English Literature. And we read tiny bits of literature from Chaucer all the way up to Toni Morrison. And on the first day of class, I remember my professor was standing in front of the class, and it was like a hundred person class in a huge lecture hall, and he recited the entirety of the prologue to the Canterbury Tales <laughs> from memory. <laughs> And right after that class, I remember running out of the classroom and phoning my mom and being like, oh my god, mom, all these people are just like me. Like, I have to switch to English. And she's like, okay, like, I don't care. Do what you want. Um, so when I switched my degree to English the next year, um, the reaction I got from most of my extended family and friends was like, oh yeah, science is really hard. Like, yeah. we understand. Yeah. Um, and that was really frustrating for a couple of reasons. Um, first, because like, I actually got really good, degree, uh, good grades in my science courses, and secondly, because they automatically assume that, assume that humanities is the easier option. Um, but I'm, I'm actually pretty glad that I got to take those science courses because with my English courses, because it helped me realize that I think I, I make better decisions when I can consider these diverse opinions from different faculties. So this allowed me to realize that an English degree for me happened to be the better decision. Um, so now, part of the reason why I continue to study English is because I'm not really a very rational or logical person, <laughs> and I know that sounds weird, and I know that as humanities students, we have to form arguments, and that involves logic, but I also know that a lot of the things that we're arguing about aren't necessarily rational. So things like love, or faith, or anxiety, or fear, or any of those things, um, they're not logical. They can't be reduced to a single data point on a page. Um, but I think asking questions and trying to figure these things out is important because it keeps us by being trapped by this kind of overwhelming desire for certainty to like boil everything down and understand everything. Um, and asking these questions, I think, can make us uncomfortable and often nihilistic. Um, but it reminds us that not everything can be reduced to kind of a bodily need. So we need 
an understanding and a meaning of thing of the way that things work just as much as we need money and jobs. Um, and none of this to say is that science isn't important. My sister's a doctor, and um, I definitely understand that science is important, and science, I think, just like literature, has helped us understand ourselves much better. So neuroscience has helped us understand how certain um, chemicals in our brains can make us feel depressed or anxious, and biology has helped us understand how our genealogy works. But I think that humanities help us understand the meanings behind these scientific discoveries. Mm -hmm. So why is it important that we know who our family is, for example? Um, I think we also need humanities to ask questions about the ethics of STEM endeavors. Um, so, for example, is cloning your pet dog really ethical? <laughs> like, I know Bar Barbara Streisand just did that. Yes. <laughs> so, or um, what about <laughs> the ethics of testing human products uh, on animals <coughs> and so on? Um, and the last point I kind of want to make is that I do think that humanities offer transferable skills, but I don't necessarily think that's the most important thing about a university degree, and especially a university degree in the humanities. Um, I think that, as I said before, the role of the university is to open us up to as many different perspectives as possible. Um, and I think that when we can consider things from multiple perspectives, we can make better decisions. So whether those decisions arise from like complex moral dilemmas or um, workplace disagreements if you're working in a coffee shop or even um, arguing with your family about why you're studying English. <laughs> like, I think, I think that's the main value of a humanities degree. Um. Well, I'm actually the complete, complete opposite of you. Um, I, like many other English students, I did grow up loving books and I read a lot. Um, I also, both of my parents are actually in the sciences. Um, and um, I was really lucky not to have any pushback from them at all. They were really supportive of me going to study um, the humanities. Um, and I think that's also because of their own experiences in just just living in, in the 20th and 21st century. Um, I actually grew up wanting to be um, a writer, and so I read a lot. I wanted to be a fiction writer, and I read a lot, and um, I actually hated academics because they were saying the worst things about the books that I liked. <laughs> uh, and, um, and eventually, when, when um, be before I started English, actually, I started in cinema because the university I went to didn't have a creative writing department and I wanted to do something creative. Um, so I went to cinema and uh, I, started, um, I started my degree, which was really, really intensive. And only, only there you learn how intensive creation can actually be. And it's not like a romantic go into nature, get, get a muse or something and go. Yeah, it, definitely not like that. We had to, we had to um, film two movies a week. Um, <laughs> And it, but after that, that first semester, um, I realized that I, I wasn't really under, I, I really enjoyed creating and I really enjoyed filming and writing, um, but I didn't really understand why. And the reason I moved to English after that was um, because I kind of, I, I wanted the background. Um, I wanted to know why certain directors, why certain writers were, um, using these techniques and, and what, what, were their, what were they basically talking to. Um, and once I started English, it became immediately clear that I, I absolutely knew nothing. Um, and, and it kind of uh, kept going from there. Um, but um, kind of t taking, taking this from a more, um, from, a writer, from uh, an aspiring writer's perspective, um, one of the things I realized, and this was also for the blog post that I wrote, um, when I grew up reading was how much um, writing influences and how much power writing actually has. What, if, if you read novels, and anybody who's been fully immersed in, in the Harry Potter series, for example, knows exactly what, what I'm talking about. Um, and I would argue that even though... Um, a lot of what English stands for in the 21st century is that it doesn't really give you a trade, is that it absolutely does. And one of the trades that English gives you is that you learn how to write. And one of the, one of the ways you learn how to write is, first of all, by reading, um, which is probably one of the best ways to learn how to write. 
And secondly, because you need to engage with all sorts of writing genres, basically, whether you're commenting on a weekly blog post or you need to write um, a five-page close reading or you need to write a 20-page or 25-page research essay. These are all practices in, in learning how to write. Um, and I remember that I think it was the first uh, Montreal International Poetry Prize workshop that we had here. Um, Asa Boxer um, was talking about the fact that in, the, in constructing the website, um, they were um, speaking with the, the business side of, uh, of the prize, and they couldn't construct a single sentence it, that, that sounded okay on the website. They, they had no idea how, how to give, a, not even a summary or an abstract, um, that, as if writing was something that didn't need to be practiced, or you didn't need to learn how to articulate what you were thinking. Um, or what you're trying to get across. Um, and that, that was really striking because I think that um, that kind of solidified one of the ideas um, that I had was that um, even, even though it doesn't, give, it doesn't train you for a job per se, um, an English degree, it definitely does teach you skills that aren't, aren't just transferable, but just a basic skill, which, is, which not everybody... Um, not everybody in STEM, in STEM, for example, learns, which is just h how, do you, how do you get your ideas across? Um, and um, so that, that was basically one of, the, one of the more important things that I was realizing. And actually in class today, um, I realized another thing that, um, well, we were talking about um, um, Renaissance education in England, and I realized that in, in their practices that um, they were being taught how, um, like th their studies uh, <coughs> was all about imitation and reproduction in a certain way, is that the mode of what we today call transferable skills it was kind of ingrained into that discipline um, in many ways, and it was kind of a base assumption of what, what a discipline should be. A, a discipline should give you skills that you can transfer because the ability to transfer skills is, is also not something that should just be taken for granted. If somebody teaches you how to, I don't know, how to work a machine in, in a science laboratory, but only that one machine, you need to be able to know how to, how to work the next machine and the other one and another one. These are all, the ability to transfer skills is just as important as, as the one single skill itself. Um, so that was just another thing that I was realizing. Um, so, so yeah, generally I, w I would say, I would argue against the fact that the humanities doesn't give a trade. And I think that's one of the, one of the major perks of studying English is that you do learn how to write and you do learn how to articulate um, your ideas and what you're thinking. And studying English also gives you the ability to argue against your parents why not to study English just because of that. Um, and. I've had these conversations with several people at the table, um, and uh, yeah, so maybe not a trade, but but definitely teaches you a craft. I would say. Nicole. Okay, uh, so this is going to sound pretty repetitive, I guess, because I also came from a family where most, of, like you know, my mom's a pharmacist, her parents are a nurse and a doctor, my dad works in like financial stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, my little sister's like an absolute genius and is going to do science as well. Um, so I guess it kind of like uh, didn't really seem, I guess, like an option almost. Uh, no, that like my parents were forcing me to do sciences, but I just like, I was just kind of assumed like, yeah, this is what I'm going to do for like a very long time. Uh, and then I sort of like, after a while, I was like, oh, maybe science isn't really my thing. And then I sort of see them like, I guess I'll do what like everyone else does that I know, anyways. And I'm like, I guess I'll do a poli sci degree because that's, <laughs> that's you know, so whatever. Um, and then it wasn't until like um, not long before I graduated that I was like, oh, I want to do English. And I was like, wow, why didn't I think about that before? Um, so I guess that was a, and I I also didn't have like very much. Uh, pushback from my family, but I do sort of get, um, so like my dad works at RBC, he's like an investment advisor, and he says, oh, well, there's a guy who works at RBC who has uh, his undergrad in English, 
And what he does is he writes weekly financial reports for RBC. So that's something you could do. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I guess it's kind of like the sort of. Oh, should I just ask? Yes. This? I'm not interested, but thanks. <laughs> um, so, I guess, yeah, that's sort of the, the <laughs> stuff that I get. They're like, oh, you have lots of transfer transferable skills, like how to write you know, financial reports. It's like, I don't know if that's. I just like. Books, you know, I don't like that. <laughs> um, so I kind of like uh, what I sort of get, like, oh, you know, you could do lots of things like journalism. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, like I sort of go into how, like, especially in taking a survey, uh, you sort of learn that like an English degree is a lot uh, in a lot of aspects. It's like a history degree. Um, in that, you know, uh, the literature of a certain time period like really reflects the time period itself and that sort of goes into uh, the idea that like all art is political which is something that I'm really um, like fascinated in I guess uh, which I guess I'll talk about later um, but yeah so I actually when I started university I was at a different university than McGill uh, and I was studying creative writing um, which I ended up uh, not enjoying as much as I thought I would because it turns out I'm not very good at being creative on demand. <laughs> uh, but we did have a course there which was uh, philosophy and writing and that was something that really interested me and that's um, sort of fueled my passion for English. Uh, and in that course we talked a lot about the idea that you know, all art is political and, uh, you know, whether you intend it to be or not, you know, um, and literature of a certain time reflects, you know, the ideas of that time. Um, and, uh, you know, our circumstances shape, you know, what we write and then in turn what we read shapes what we think. Uh, so I think that's a very, like, um, you know, fascinating, uh, a really interesting and like always, you know, perpetually relevant um, Concept, I don't know. <laughs> Fact. Uh, so that's um, yeah, that was something that I really um, sort of like latched onto. I guess. Like, oh yeah, all art is political, and like <laughs> you know. Um, so then, uh, yeah, I did creative writing for a bit, and that wasn't really my thing. So then I um, started taking literature uh, at McGill, um, and I think another thing that. I really enjoyed uh, discussing in survey as well as, um, and I guess it sort of ties in with, you know, we kind of think that, you know, currently, you know, in today's society, it's very hard to, you know, get a job if you're studying literature. And I like think that, uh, you know, in survey, we sort of learned that there's kind of always been this uh, worry that like society is going downhill and we're all, you know, gonna, die like <laughs> um, so I think that's kind of a reassuring thing like you know even in like you know the 1500s they're like oh this generation is terrible at writing um, and I think that's just a very reassuring thing because I think especially and there is there's a fair amount of bad contemporary writing um, but I think like just sort of learning that you know we're kind of always in this cycle of um, you know we think that you know the newest generation is bad, um, and it turns out they're really not, uh, so yes, that's reassuring, um, but yeah, I guess, uh, just the biggest, uh, thing for me in studying English is that it's so, like, applicable, you know, and there's no, there's no objective answer, and, uh, I love that, um, because I hate objective truths, I guess, um, and also, like, it's something that, you know, never stops developing and it's, you know, you never stop, you can interpret something like a million different ways and there's no correct interpretation of a text um, and there's no, there's good and bad writing, but like there's no, you know, right way to write something. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing is, uh, you know, it's something that you never stop learning about and it's like, oh, it's <laughs> that, well, that. Um, yeah, I don't 
Jen. So there are a few things I want to do today, but as a way of getting started, I thought it might be worthwhile to consider some of the implications of not studying English. Because although we tend to think of our discipline as being more or less localized to various departments of English, the influence of what we do can actually be seen throughout so much of society, including within the very measurable, very directly impactful world of the public sphere. It's there, I think, that the impact of getting an education in the humanities becomes very apparent when we stop to consider the question of what it would mean to be led by someone who isn't a reader. Now, this is a question that's relevant at all levels of government, but it's particularly important when we get to the office of the Prime Minister. And it's a question that one of my favorite Canadian writers, Jan Martel, took up some years back in his book, 101 Letters to a Prime Minister, which was provoked, among other things, by something that Stephen Harper once said when he claimed that his favorite book was the Guinness Book of World Records. (laughs) So, (coughs) knowing this, and very rightly being disturbed by it, Martel asks, quote, If Stephen Harper isn't a reader, then what is his mind made of? (laughs) How did he get his insights into the human condition? (laughs) What materials went into the building of his sensibility? What is the color, the pattern, the rhyme and reason of his imagination? The novel, the play, the poem, these are all formidable tools for learning about people, the world, and life. And a leader must know about people, the world, and life. So to those who aspire to be successful leaders, he says, if you want to lead effectively, you must read widely, end quote. In other words, although we tend to think of studying English as something that we do for ourselves or as something that doesn't really have a very far reach, as Martel says, it's actually a decision that, within the context of constructing a society, has an incredibly wide-ranging and significant impact because the texture of a person's imagination affects not only their life, but also the lives of everyone with whom they come into contact or have any kind of influence over, which, in the case of a government official, is a lot of people. To extend that, though, I also just briefly wanted to address the impact of studying English on a more personal level through the lens of this wonderful James Wright poem that you all have on your hand up. Because in my experience, people will often use the exact phrase that studying English is a waste of time. Mm -hmm. And so in response to that, I've chosen one of the poems that makes me most convinced that I'm not wasting my time. So I'll start by reading this out loud, and then I'll talk a little bit about how it relates to today's discussion. Lying in a hammock at William Duffy's farm in Pine Island, Minnesota. Over my head, I see the bronze butterfly asleep on the black trunk, (coughs) blowing like a leaf in green shadow. Down the ravine behind the empty house, The cowbells follow one another into the distances of the afternoon. To my right, in a field of sunlight between two pines, the droppings of last year's horses blaze up into golden stones. I lean back as the evening darkens and comes on. A chicken hawk floats over, looking for home. I have wasted my life. One of the things I find so compelling about this poem is that it contains so many of the elements for which our discipline is often criticized. I mean, at first glance, this seems to be very sentimental, very insubstantial, and it doesn't really seem as though it's addressing any particularly important issues. But if you look for it, there's a lot here. For instance, this poem invites us to consider that the reason why the speaker feels that his life has been wasted was because it was a life of not having paid enough attention, of not having previously noticed any of these things. Or, as Patricia Hampel notes, quote, lying in the hammock, the speaker realizes that this has never happened to him before. He has never truly seen the world in its reality and detail. 
and he is stunned to realize this, end quote. Again, people will often say that it's a waste of time to study English specifically, but also the humanities more generally. And yet, as I think this poem beautifully illustrates, studying the humanities can actually keep us from wasting our time, not only by waking us to the things that we should be paying attention to, but also by teaching us to think critically and thereby giving us the tools to notice, appreciate, and then engage with those things. To my mind, in other words, studying English gives us the tools with which to see the world in its reality and detail, the tools with which to pay attention, regardless of whatever it is that post-graduation, we then end up using those tools to pay attention to. And that, for me, is what makes it such a compelling and contributed discipline. Thank you. So our last speaker is Amelia Halloran. Yeah. Hi. Um, I feel like that was such a practical and interesting look at the sort of what makes English like worth studying. But my reasoning for studying English is much less practical. It's just that I really like to read. Um, <laughs> I think that we have this weird idea that in order for hard work to be meaningful and to be like appreciated as hard work, it has to be something that like you don't enjoy. <laughs> um, if you're working hard at something you love, then it's it just it is not credited as fully. Um, but I think that you learn more and you gain more from doing from working hard in like a, something that you truly value and something that you love. Um, it was interesting when you were talking about how the books that you loved, you know, are not necessarily the things that you're reading because I think that when we as English students might complain about the work that we're doing or our course loads or falling behind on readings, our classmates have a tendency to say things like, but you'd be reading in your own time anyway, or um, <laughs> there's this idea that like because you enjoy reading that like this isn't work, um, which I don't think is true at all. Um, and I can also say that I'm in my fourth year, so <coughs> I'm graduating and I'm getting all of those questions like, mm -hmm. what are you applying for? Is it in your field? And when you don't apply for things that are based in English, you get a lot of comments from family members uh, sort of that are smirking about how mm -hmm. the degree wasn't worth it. And I think to that, I would say, A lot of the skills that I learned obviously are going to be applied, but more so than that, like the, the, the chance to spend four years reading and, and learning about like the books that I love um, will be worth it to me in the long run, no matter how much of my degree is directly applicable to the work. Um, also, the, the field is not dying at the rate that um, your uncle will lead you to believe. Um, books are still being published, people are still writing, and I think that it's really amazing in sort of the internet age how people who love to read have come together in online spaces and even have created indus sort of industries for themselves where they didn't exist before. Um, I think that if you are truly passionate about literature, as I think all of us are, then the, the reason to study English like, should be obvious, and I think that you'll find a way to go forward with it post-university. Well, thank you, Haley, and that was, it sort of worked out beautifully, because I think that was a, a great note um, to end on. Um, just First of all, let's just thank everyone. <laughs> say a couple of things. I mean, I think, you know, sort of many of the things that we've heard are, are things we've thought about ourselves and the reasons that people are here. I mean, one of the things that um, we often do think about is the fact that in English we learn skills that are transferable to other areas, or we learn writing, we learn communication, and those are obviously very, very important for us. But I think that those themselves are kind of the products. They're not the, what we came for. Mm -hmm. I mean, we feel that this is what we get, but it's not really what, what drew us um, to literature. Literature, And I think that, you know, I'm glad that Haley, you ended with that way, because I think that one of the things we often are afraid to talk about is precisely the pleasure in literature. It feels guilty and selfish. Unlike those really unselfish people in business, oh. for example, <laughs> who are putting themselves through the torture of working towards, you know, sort of a $5 million a year career, you know, sort of, a, no, I mean, we're, we're being so selfish and self-indulgent. 
But I think that's, that's the kind of argument that an English student should be questioning. You know, sort of, what's the assumption of that? That we should all be, that education is to make yourself miserable? That pleasure is, is somehow, you know, sort of evil? Um, but I think it also skirts to the question of what gives us pleasure? And that's, I think, something we need to think about more. And it was coming out in, in um, um, some of the things you're talking about. I mean, Rachel, I'm so glad you, you brought up the very simple fact that you know, people do think so often that studying English is easy, that you switch from science to English because it's the bird course. I'd like to get some of those people from science in a Milton class. I'd have them <laughs> crying on the floor for five minutes. They wouldn't last a, a moment um, here. You know, so, and I know I have students, you know, not, not Ronnie, but others who, you know, sort of who, who um, have done much better in their science classes, but are still taking English because they like the chance. You know? um, and, um, you know, so it's, you know, it's really, really hard. So it's not that it's a pleasure of an easy ride. It's the pleasure that comes from a challenge. And I think you put it very well, Rachel, too, when you said we need understanding as, we need as, we make, as much as we need jobs. That it's the pleasure that comes from, from understanding, or what Jana was talking about, too, of seeing the world, of paying attention, that it's, it's an intellectual pleasure, too. Um, I think that is something that we, we really derive from it. And I would say, first of all, what's wrong with that? But also, too, about what's good about that. I think that that is very important. Would you rather have a world in which people were intellectually alive and stimulated than a world in which people were doing things that they hated. 